say welcome to everybody officially to today's webinar. My name is Alexi Lynch. I'm the business manager at Ironbark Sustainability. Uh, we've got quite a few presenters here today, including Jen St. Jack from Resilient Hills and Coast, um, the central coordinator, I should say, of the Regional Climate Partnerships, uh, Nelly Belperio from Charles Sturt, Catherine Warhurst from Transition Towns, Gawler, Crystal Chambers from Climate Ready Communities at the Red Cross, Imogen Jubb and Nikki Coles from Beyond Zero Emissions, and Matt Sullivan from Ironbark Sustainability. Before we get started, as most people will know from housekeeping who have been at webinars before, uh, only presenters can be heard or seen during the presentation. It's a little bit different to Zoom. You're encouraged, however, to ask any questions at any time through your go-to webinar question box. We'll try and answer them as we go along. Depending on the number of questions, we might wait until the end to answer them. Um, and as always, if we don't have time today, we'll answer them at a later date. Please try and be specific and clear as possible when writing your question. And note also that this webinar is being recorded. I'm going to give a bit of an introduction today into developing community emissions profiles and an introduction to Snapshot. A bit of a discussion on data because everyone loves talking about data from the questions we got through in advance anyway. Um, and then passing to Jen, Catherine, Crystal and Imogen um, to talk about how we've got to this stage with SA councils um, and the view from community organisations where Snapshot has its genesis. I'd like to first acknowledge the First Nations people throughout Australia, uh, where I'm speaking from, on traditional lands of the people of the Kulin Nations, the Wurundjeri people in Melbourne. I wish to acknowledge them as the traditional owners and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and elders of other communities. We acknowledge the land on which we are having these discussions today is a place of age-old ceremonies and celebration, and this land was never ceded. This is Ironbark. Uh, this is some of the Ironbark staff anyway in the Melbourne office. For those that don't know us, we work with local governments around Australia to reduce emissions on council operational buildings, lights, etc., and in the broader community. This is you, who is here, or who was here as of yesterday. So we've got about, we had about 33 registrations in the end. We've got a few people who are coming from um, multiple, uh, a few people from, multiple people from some of the councils, um, but a nice showing. So thanks everyone from coming along. Um, and we also asked you at the start when you registered whether you had a profile or not and here were the results of that question. So um, the majority of people who are attending today have never had a profile or have no idea and um, some of you said yep we've got a recent profile or yeah we've got one that's up to date so that's a, a bit of an understanding of guess about where we're at. And finally here are the questions and comments that you provided in advance. No need to take any of this down because we'll send it through um, after this. A lot of questions around data and so we've, we've got some Q&A at the end that'll specifically um, discuss data as well. All right, missions profiles, aren't they fun? 13 years ago, about 240 councils around Australia had community emissions profiles, including a hell of a lot of South Australian councils. This was generally through the city's climate protection campaign, and a few people who are out there today I know were involved in this program, uh, working and providing this information and data for councils around Australia. However, when this guy became Prime Minister, there was a grand carbon production reduction scheme or the CPRS or carbon price that was of course going to solve all of our problems and so all of the ancillary funding for programs such as cities climate protection were cut. And so instead of 240 councils representing 84% of the population having an emissions profile there for the community, uh, overnight it kind of went to just a handful. Working with um, our partners in this project, Beyond Zero Emissions, a couple of years ago, we surveyed councils around Australia and asked who has a community inventory or profile. 70% said, no, nah, we don't. So things had changed a couple of years ago. This was in about 2017, 2018. You compare this, for example, to councils having a corporate inventory and understanding of their own operational emissions, and we see that the majority of councils do have such a thing. However, in the lead up to the Paris Climate Conference, 
a bunch of councils that were working on an international program then called the Compact of Mayors were required to have an emissions profile for their whole municipality to progress through this program. Um, and there's a spattering of councils there that were involved in developing and having these profiles signed off and ticked, um, which meant that they could progress and were given acknowledgement and recognition through this compact of mayors, which is now called the Global Covenant of Mayors. I think from our point of view, that that um, that meant there was a bit of an increase in the re-emergence of community emissions profiles because once you start looking into the data that's um, available and required to develop these things, you can kind of develop them for all. So this Global Covenant of Mayors, Climate and Energy, a couple of regional projects. So we were working with C40 cities in the city of Melbourne a few years ago to help regional, or sorry, metropolitan Melbourne, 32 councils around Melbourne develop these profiles. Beyond Zero Emissions had been working with a lot of communities in developing emissions profiles. Um, uh, Sydney, New South Wales, <coughs> state government were funding similar things. And so before too long, we had those numbers increase again. A lot of these projects also included workshops and education around it. So the one with the City of Melbourne, C40, and the 32 Metropolitan Melbourne Councils involved a bunch of workshops and training to basically explain what the, these profiles are for, how you develop them, and what the underlying data is and means. This is that wonderful underlying data, the Global Protocol for Community Scale Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventories shortened nicely to GPC. This is basically the accounting principle that sits behind developing an emissions profile for your community. So I'm sure a lot of people have been involved in developing corporate emissions inventories where you've got the ENGAS um, and NCOS sort of guidelines that we use. When it comes to the broader community municipal wide emissions, we use GPC. And that's a document there that you can download, 250 odd pages that explains exactly how to do it, the calculations, what you need to do, the different methodologies. Um, and the reason we have this is so that there's no duplication of emissions across municipal boundaries and also to make sure there's no um, missing of emissions. So we don't want to have double counting, we don't want to be missing any, so we all try and sing from the same song book. You can do it yourself. You can download this document. If you like, it's freely available online or you can find it on the Snapshot website. Uh, you can do courses and find out, um, make sure that you're doing the right thing and you can be accredited to develop one of these profiles, but personally they're pretty boring for most people. Um, and so there are other ways to go about it, like um, working with experts. We're very lucky because one of the people who was involved in actually developing the standard a few years ago, Matt Sullivan, um, is involved in the snapshot team um, and has a very keen eye for data. Um, that's what Matt does in his spare time. So he really loves getting into it and making sure that everything is absolutely spot on. I don't want to get into too much detail yet about data and the GPC protocol, but one thing I will mention off the bat is that there are five principles around how you get data and data and information and sources needs to be relevant, complete, consistent, transparent, and accurate. And the most important thing about this little slide is these are in order. So this is a bit of a shift from how you might um, previously or traditionally thought about data and the main thing is getting accurate data, accurate data, accurate data. What this says is that accurate data is irrelevant and can't be used in the development of a profile if it is not complete. The first thing is to get relevant and complete information. Make sure that it can be consistent so next year you can get the same data source. Make sure it's transparent and then make sure it's accurate. And this isn't designed to say, let's get inaccurate info. It's tried to make it clear that these things can be really challenging, getting data sources that are outside of your control. So let's start by making sure it's relevant and complete and let's improve on the accuracy over time. So one thing you'll notice is that when we talk about emissions profiles, we very clearly use the word profile. A lot of the um, nomenclature from internationally will be infantry. They'll talk about community infantries, and we used to do this in Australia as well. But as far as we're concerned, it's very misleading to call a community emissions um, inventory an inventory because there are always going to be areas that are modelled, and so it leads an unrealistic expectation of how accurate the data is. Profiles are profiles. 
They're not infantries. Also caution about using them as baselines, and we'll get into that as well. And they will absolutely change. Okay. Having done a lot of this work over the last couple of years, and having been working with Beyond Zero Emissions, Australia's leading climate change uh, think tank, we found that we were both really working on this together. We were both developing emissions profiles for cities and community groups, councils, groups around Australia, and thought it's probably a good idea to combine our IP and our expertise and try and provide information that is freely available for community groups and for councils throughout the whole of Australia. If councils and community groups are still spending arduous time and effort developing profiles, um, none of us are really doing our jobs as well as we should. So we got together and worked with a couple of partners, including some funding organisations that are listed there. And these are the ones that were initially involved in funding and developing Snapshot. In South Australia, as we'll go through in a second, we've had a unique and brilliant crowdfunding model where a bunch of councils have essentially um, got together to contribute to Snapshot. Um, and we've also moved to ensure that the, the data is all checked by third parties and shared and as transparent as possible uh, to make this more of a broad collaboration, not something where a council engages a consultant to do the work. Thanks to the initial funding from the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation and Sustainability Victoria, we essentially got all our data together and created Snapshot, which is a website that has now has South Australian councils online and hopefully many of you guys have jumped on and had a look. Basically, you jump on and you can explore and see the Snapshot emissions profiles for any council currently in Vic, New South Wales, South Australia and a smattering from other municipalities. Once you click on your snapshot, you get to see where your emissions are coming from. Here are some examples. Onkaprinka, Charles Sturt, broken down into the key emissions areas. Adelaide Hills, Marion, Port Lincoln, Victor Harbour. Jump on, have a look. Separate it into the um, key sources and subsectors that are required according to the GPC protocol. That is Snapshot. You can also download for free a two-page report with your Snapshot. Um, there is a paid version of the report as well called a comparison report, but otherwise everything is essentially free and the intention is to share our resources and be as efficient as possible instead of having duplication in the sector. Since it was first launched last year, councils in New South Wales and Victoria have been using it quite a bit um, in a variety of different ways. One of the key ways we've found is that they've been using it to target action areas. So to have an understanding of where the emissions pro, um, sources are within their community and then target appropriately. Um, so let's take for example, a city like Greater Dandenong, which is a large municipality in the east of Melbourne. Um, councils like this received their profiles and started to realise that, uh, for example, residential electricity use was lower than expected, industrial was a lot higher, and there was a fair chunk of transport there that they weren't really looking at when they were looking at interventions within the community. Um, and possibly the amount of resourcing and funding towards these areas wasn't in keeping with where the sources were. And so they use that information then to target the best placed intervention. So for example, for transport, looking at electric vehicle charging use and what's gonna happen as a business as usual trajectory up to over the next 20, 30 years and what they can do then to improve that. Looking at these areas, the large proportions of those snapshot pies. Snapshot has been used a lot for communications. So one of the benefits, and probably from my point of view, what I saw as the most surprising and wonderful benefit of it is just that Snapshot looks nice, so much better than, you know, grainy kind of Excel spreadsheets that we've seen in the past. And so a lot of community groups and councils have been using it to try and communicate um, their emissions profiles throughout council or to community groups and vice versa been used for collaborative action planning um, and I point you to a few examples of um, 
pretty amazing research undertaken by BZE over the last couple of years, most recently the Millions Job, Million Jobs Plan. If you're noticing that there's a hell of a lot of industrial emissions within your municipality, um, then it's time to start looking at the areas there and working with key emitters within that sector on reducing emissions or how you can assist and facilitate change. Or maybe not work together. So here's an example in New South Wales where three um, rural councils, Gilgandra, Gunnedah and Griffith, these profiles were developed and uploaded last year and we had a very quick early question from um, Griffith who were wondering what was wrong with their profile because the little piece of the pie for agriculture was too small. And what ended up being the case is that they they have very similar economic profiles, these three councils, where agriculture is a very large part of the, um, the um, revenue, um, the economy, the local economy. However, Griffith has lower emitting ag activities, such as sheep, crops, whatever it might be. Um, and so there's less opportunity to work, for example, there um, on actions and interventions to reduce emissions from ag, although possibly the other way around, Gilgandra and Gunnedah could be looking at the sort of things that happen within Griffith if they wanted to move or try and facilitate more low emitting agriculture. Snapshot is being used and has been used to illustrate the scale of the challenge. And here's an example just from the city of Bayside who have declared a climate emergency earlier in the year. And part of their climate emergency process has been to develop a plan and to get input. And what they're saying to the community is, here are where our emissions are from. And they're using that to inform the community when they are um, seeking input into their plan. As I move on to data, I just remind you, please jump into the GoToWebinar question box if you'd like. Keep the questions coming. Any clarifying questions that are burning, I can jump into. Otherwise, we can um, get to the rest at the end. Uh, a few points on data. The first thing is this: the data un underlying snapshot has been endorsed many times over. So it is compliant with the global protocol. It's developed by a bunch of people that have sat and passed examinations in this area. Four or five years ago, this data was sent to um, key international organisations in Brussels and Bonn to review, and they absolutely came back to us with questions and things that we had to fix up before giving it the tick of approval for councils that were part of the Global Covenant of Mayors or members of ICLEI. And then through the City of Melbourne project a few years ago, the C40 Cities Group also wanted to look under the bond and make sure that everything was okay. Once we had funding from the Lord Mayor's Travel Foundation, there was also a very rigorous third party peer review process with Sustainability Victoria and Renew, formerly the Alternative Energy Association, Technology Association, sorry, um, who reviewed the data. Um, and incidentally, the data and the methodology is all available. So part of this is to make sure that we have as transparent information as possible. Anyone can jump onto the Snapshot website, download the methodology. From here, over the next couple of months and years, um, we, we the Snapshot Collaboration or Broader Family, if you like, are looking at improving data. So we'll get into that in a little bit later, but this means ideally getting more granular and accurate data sources once we can be sure that it is complete and relevant. Um, incorporating action planning, so providing advice to community groups and to councils that uh, if you've got a large proportion of your emissions that are from transport or for ag, what do we do now? And is there some way that we can incorporate action planning and intervention planning within that? Getting other stakeholders involved is really important to this process. The intention now is that it's not something that is owned by one personal organisation, but we sort of work together on where Snapshot can go. Reporting. Reporting is such a pain in the ass for councils. The ability to report automatically through a snapshot could be something that would be quite straightforward if you are involved in any of those larger processes or international programs. You just click a button and the data goes through having already have been pre-verified. And finally, incorporating targets for those councils that want to, so they can use it as a larger um, communications piece. I am now going to hand over first to Jen St. Jack, who is the Central Coordinator of the Regional Climate Partnerships. 
So bear with me for a second. Jen, are you there? Can you unmute yourself? And do you have slides or are you happy just to have a chat? Hello. Hi. Um, I don't have slides and I'm happy to just have a chat. Um, everyone can hear me? Perfect. Great. So thank you so much, Lex, for that introduction. I'm just going to cover off a bit on how this, um, this collaboration came about in South Australia. So uh, a number of South Australian councils have obviously been working on climate action for a long time through the regional climate partnerships and through their own initiatives. And I guess one of the uh, the first real drivers for um, getting some community emissions profiles was actually the town of Gawler, which was the first council in South Australia to declare a climate emergency. And since then, um, a number of other councils, including Charles Sturt, who's led this project, have been putting up their hands saying, yes, we want, really want to understand the um, the community profile of greenhouse gas emissions in our area so that we can better target our our initiatives to help them. And I think um, a lot of a lot of councils will be familiar with this idea, like you mentioned earlier, Lex, of uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm for rooftop solar in residential and a lot of council effort that goes into those kinds of projects, whereas actually that might not be the best bang for your buck because, you know, in South Australia, our grid is decarbonising anyway and we have really great uptake of roof, rooftop solar. You know, the market's already kind of dealing with that. Um, and there are other opportunities to um, broaden the scope and look at other options. So uh, following some meetings that we had with a number of councils, Nellie Belperio, City of Charles Sturt, really took up the reins on this and has been uh, working through the regional climate partnerships to get other councils on board. And we were absolutely thrilled that 18 councils have put up their hand and said, yeah, we're willing to put our money where our mouth is and make this happen for all communities in South Australia. So really, really fantastic outcome. And thank you to all the councils who've been involved. Uh, so without further ado, I am going to hand over to Catherine Warhurst. So Catherine is the chair of the Climate Emergency Action Group for the town of Gawler and has been really pushing for these snapshots to be, uh, to be developed for the town of Gawler uh, for quite some time. And uh, Catherine will share a little bit about her thoughts on how council might be able to use this data. Um, thanks very much, Jen. Um, just checking if everybody can hear me. Lex or somebody, uh, can yeah. you hear me? Okay, great. Um, Certainly can, Catherine. Have you got slides, Catherine? No, no. Okay, cool. Um, I think, well, thanks for the intro. That saved me some time. That's great. Um, and um, yeah, I'd definitely like to thank all the other councils that have been working in this group and particularly the city of Charles Sturt for their um, kind of effort in coordinating um, the group of councils because I know that is a fair bit of work and it's been greatly appreciated uh, from our perspective. Um, for a little bit of context, um, I don't work for a council. Uh, I'm a community member. Uh, I live in Gawler, so the town of Gawler. Um, I've been involved with the, or I was involved in setting up Transition Town Gawler that's been pushing for climate action in our region for a number of years. Um, and then when um, the um, council declared a climate emergency of which we were very supportive, I also applied um, to become part of the group and uh, was successful and also um, was voted as the chair of the group, uh, which has been um, a real honour to do this work for my community. Yes, Gawler was the first um, council in South Australia to declare a climate emergency, but I don't think we can say that we were the furthest along in terms of climate action. A lot of our work to date has been about um, getting data, and that's why we've been very keen on um, getting access to the kind of data that Snapshot gives us. It's 
primarily going to help us prioritise our actions. So in um, the work that we've done on this action plan for Gawler to date, we've been focusing on the information available on the council itself as opposed to the community. In gathering that data, um, we've been taking a prioritisation approach in that we look at what's the biggest piece of pie, and then we go, well, how can we, how can we, you know, do the most effective actions for that? L Happily, it's it's been shaking out that um, a lot of our targets um, fall within the time frame of 2030 or before, which I wasn't that optimistic going into the process. I'm certainly conscious of the fact that our council emissions are a very small percentage, and I've just quickly calculated it's probably only about 1% of the broader community emissions that is revealed in the snapshot tool. So that's really showing us that we've got a lot of work to do. I'm really looking forward to using the uh, tool, not only for the ability to prioritise our actions, but also I must, um, uh, emphasise the graphic representation is incredibly useful as a communication tool. I used um, a sample of somebody else's snapshot in presenting to our councillors in previous uh, discussions and the, um, the nature of the graphic representation really is so effective. I'm really looking forward to using it in our next steps when we're reaching out to build up community partnerships to work on the you know, the really important phase of dealing with the rest of the 99% of our emissions, which are based in our community, uh, of which we don't have absolute control over. So um, I'm really, really looking forward to using those images um, in, in telling the story to the community as we take our next steps. And that's pretty much it from me. Thank you, Thank you Catherine. Catherine. That was... Sorry, Lex, I totally jumped in. <laughs> Over to you, Jen. Thank you. Um, really great to hear how um, how Gawler is going to use the snapshot as uh, as a council, and I think that graphic representation is a really critical part of the value of, of this tool. It really just makes it easy for everyone to understand, which is brilliant. Um, next up, I'd like to introduce Crystal Chambers uh, from the Red Cross, who runs the Climate Ready Communities Program. So this program was another initiative of the regional climate partnerships in partnership with the Red Cross. And it's really about helping to empower our, um, our community members to take local action in their own communities. But I'm sure Crystal will tell you more about that. And uh, when I shared with Crystal that, that uh, this this joint procurement was happening, I think she was really, really thrilled to hear about it and uh, was able to really quickly share it with, uh, with the community via their communications channels. And I think she'll talk a little bit about that and, and the enthusiasm that has come out of that so far. Thanks, Jen. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Beautiful. Um, yeah, absolutely excited to hear about this collaboration and this project. Um, and so were the Climate Ready Champions, which is the, the group of community members that Jen just mentioned. We call them champs for short. Um, yeah, a lot of excitement around having this, having access to this data. Um, and as Kath just mentioned, um, as a great communication tool, um, and I, I think a lot of people are going to view this as a really um, effective place to begin some new collaborations in council and community and really getting heads around some strategic actions that can be taken together. So um, I think Jen's done a really great job of introducing climate ready communities, um, but I will just add that a lot of the focus of the program has been around um, adaptations to climate. Um, although there's huge appetite for mitigation as well. Um, one of the parts of the program that we're really trying to pin down is um, asking people to think strategically about the, the actions that they take to make sure that they do try and tick both those adaptation and mitigation boxes. Um, so tools like this really help to 
I guess, remind people to to um, really examine um, what kind of act, um, actions that they're taking and whether or not the adaptations are in fact maladaptations and may inadvertently contribute to higher emissions in other areas. So that's been um, a really cool bit of feedback from people. Um, I think also one of the things that has been strongly highlighted throughout the Climate Ready Communities program to me um, and to some of our council partners and community members or champs is that there's still a lot of gaps that really clearly exist between community understanding of what council actions are taking place around climate as well as um, a, a lack of understanding from council perspective on what community actions or climate work is going on and also what community need and want and, and the program that I've been working on um, has tried to help sort of branch that um, or bridge that I should say and a tool like this is just so amazingly useful in um, helping to break down some of those discussions um, and point to what um, what sort of actions councils are taking, um, particularly around building a profile. So, and I know that you said baseline is not the correct word to use around a profile, but to sort of, to get community members to understand that we need to have a picture of where we're, we're starting from at this point so that we can be really strategic um, and effective in the actions that we plan to take. Um, so yeah. As a collaborative tool, as a communication tool, I think this is brilliant and there's a lot of excitement from community members in in um, exploring how it can be used um, in those sorts of ways as well. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. I'm excited for the launch. Thank you, Christelle. And Dan and Catherine, we've still got your other line as well in case questions come through, but if you could um, ask you to just mute yourself while you're not speaking, that would be great. Um, and I'm just going to pass over now to Imogen. Um, Imogen, do you have slides or do you want to just have a bit of a discussion um, about I, your experience? I, um, um, it's been music to my ears to hear Catherine and Crystal <laughs> talking about how the community is interested in using um, Snapchat because that's exactly our intention. Um, a lot of a lot of communities are really interested in how they can take effective action on climate change and have uh, felt really quite stuck. I think, um, and I think a lot of councils have taken really effective actions around driving their council emissions, um, corporate emissions to zero, but. I'll also struggle to communicate and work collaboratively with their communities. And I think this tool is just a fantastic conversation starter um, and can really help communities and councils work together. So that's a really clear intention we had in developing the tool. So it's really great to hear that that conversation is already happening in Gawla and other communities around South Australia. Um, the tool has a new feature, which is not quite out yet, but um, it will have a share function um, shortly. And so we're really interested in how to use it again as a communication tool so socially. So it should be really easy to share the socials of a particular um, profile and, um, and spread that conversation both from council to community and from communities to councils as well. Um, we're interested in sharing the Gawler profile today and uh, talking about Transition Gawler and um, how it can kickstart those conversations. It's also really great to hear that um, it's being used to prioritise actions because that's also a really key next step is how can we effectively provide resources for communities and councils to make the most effective actions they can depending on the particular profile that they have. Um, and we're also really interested to use it, not just around emissions reductions, but use it as a kickstart for conversations around jobs and stimulus. 
Um, VZE just recently put out our million jobs plan and I think it helps change the conversation from like what will it cost to get our emissions to zero to how many jobs can it create to get our emissions to zero, how many jobs in agriculture, how many jobs in energy, how many jobs in transport would it create to actually change the emissions profile of our community. And I think that's a really, uh, you know, it's a very different frame around having this conversation with both your community and your councils. Um, but it certainly has opportunity to support regional jobs and um, jobs that can improve the well-being of your particular community. Um, we also, um, the tool will also save communities and councils heaps and heaps of time. Um, when I first started along the process around zero um, carbon communities, uh, it took almost a year for the first communities to figure out their data. And that was kind of the, the big action that they took for the first year was getting their emissions profile. Um, and so being able to get that at a press of a button is just an enormous change and um, a much better use of community's time. So they can spend that time and effort in community engagement, which is a much better use of their skills and expertise. So we're really quite proud of that um, outcome. And we're also really keen to see how we can build the evidence base around what the best actions communities and councils can take. So watch this space, we'll keep developing, um, developing our work in that area. And as the data improves, that um, those components should become, that understanding should become much richer and more granular to each particular community. So yeah, it's really, I'm really grateful to all the SA team who've helped pull this together. Um, it's really exciting to see um, all the profiles live. And if you have communities uh, or, or if you know of community groups in your particular area who might be interested in joining the Zero Carbon Communities, um, initiative, um, please let them know about Zero, Zero Carbon Communities. Um, it's a free program, there's no obligations, it really is just about providing information and support for communities wanting to take this um, path. And um, there's also a, a, I went to a preview for a new ABC show which is coming out in a couple of weeks um, around emissions. So I think in the next few weeks there'll be a big spike of interest in what communities can do to drive um, action in their local area. I think that's all from me. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, Imogen. <laughs> Stay on the line. We'll get to the questions now, and there might be some questions that come through about that. But um, I share your excitement to hear that from Crystal and Catherine. It was bloody awesome. Um, the questions we received in advance. Um, we will answer them all, if not now, in information over the next um, couple of days. Image, and I'm just going to mute you if that's okay. I'm getting a bit of feedback there. Um, and a lot of the questions were around data. And so I'm going to start this little Q&A section off talking about data. Um, so, for example, people wanting to use their own data, and some of these have also started coming through in the uh, GoToWebinar question box. So keep um, jumping in there and asking your questions, and we'll get to what we can. Um, so we had questions around, you know, how are rose emissions calculated? What are included? What's the methodology? What's accurate? Can we provide data? Can I use my own data? Can we use local data? Data, 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 data. data. Um, I'll take you back to this slide. Um, around the GPC protocol, which is very clear on the sort of data that can and cannot be used in developing a profile. And the whole time since we started the development of Snapshot and even before then, the first thing was to make sure that it was compliant with this protocol. Um, that fed through and was discussed when Snapshot was in development. There were a bunch of user groups and testing groups that um, also reflected that, of course, this is the most in, important thing. And again, what that means is that complete data and consistent data is considered more important than accurate data. And I just want to point out as well, this is an external um, process. So this isn't something that's developed by us. I think actually the beauty of this protocol has been developed by the key international stakeholders from around the world to say we need to have a process where we work together on this and it does shift the understanding of the role of accuracy. 
Uh, our take is that accuracy should always just be matched to the requirements of the decision being made because it's only going to be as valuable as the decision that influences. So if you've got the chance of you know, getting inverted commas a lot more accurate data but it's going to take you time and effort and it's not going to change your decision, then we need to be um, strategic about the importance of it and whether it's worth putting in time. So here's a little case study that I'm going to leave there for 20 seconds for people to read. So if you're going to try and spend money to get data that is so much more accurate and you were inaccurate at first as you first thought, then of course it's just going to change nothing. And so we've sort of taken this approach on ensuring that the first thing is to get complete data, make sure we're as transparent as possible, and then strategically try and improve it. What that means is, as far as the reporting international pro reporting processes are concerned, you've got three tiers of data. And the majority of data um, that is in, to, in Snapshot and in any emissions profile that could be considered compliant in Australia is considered tier one. So it's largely modelled. This is where you're getting larger state-based data sets, for example, and scaling them down to the local level. It's not just a matter of looking at scaling by population. It is very involved and detailed. And when we do occasionally get more granular data sources from distribution businesses, for example, what we generally find is that we are very close to what would be expected and what they are showing. So tier one, model data, and then national um, emissions factors, which is generally what's used in Australia. Ideally, we want to move to tier two. So we start getting data, for example, for electricity from Zappen. Give us the information, postcode by postcode, split up according to residential, commercial and industrial, um, and then we keep using the, the national or state-based emissions factors. The challenge here is getting that data from third parties, and I bet a lot of you out there have received this before. We have received this sort of information from distribution businesses many times over the last 20 years, but unfortunately what keeps happening is that it is not complete, and they miss large sections of the data, and they don't tell you about it. Finally, tier three, which is would be, I'm assuming, considered pretty unusual in Australia, where as well as the local activity data, you've got local emissions factors. So you've actually got an emissions factor for Gawler, which might be different to Campbelltown. Um, I'm not sure that's really on our radar at the moment. We are looking and have been looking at all these improvements over the last three or four years in developing Snapshot, and believe me, 20 years since 2007 and before, by trying to find information from distribution businesses, for example, but it needs to be a strategic approach where we talk to them over a long period of time and not just say, hey, here's the data we want, but here is the queries that we want you to be using in your data sets. We want some sort of transparency so we can make sure that you're not changing it year on year, and we want to make sure that you're not excluding large data sets, which is inevitably what happens. So we're still yet to find a magic pill or a magic bullet through working with them, but we will persist. We want to persist and we want to hear how people have had luck in different states and in SA in dealing, for example, with SAPN. In the meantime, we've found that there are other organisations where we're having a lot more traction. So transport, for example, traditionally has always been modelled. Unless you know activity data, which means you know when cars and trams and trains and buses are going in and out of your municipality, you have got model data sets and no one has that information apart from Google or Telstra or organisations that have access to smartphones and GPS devices. So over the last couple of years, we've been working with Google to make sure or to try and access their travel and transport data. We are days away from signing an agreement and getting the data out there. We were hoping to have it by now but dealing with large-ish organisations like Google often presents challenges. Um, it's not signed on the dotted line, but it is very, very likely that in the next couple of weeks we'll be able to break down transport to further subsectors and we will be able to say this isn't just modelled information, this is real, accurate activity data. The process of doing this as a group makes sense. It would be very inefficient for individual councils or even states to be talking to these data providers because you don't ask for just data for your postcode or your council. You really say, let's have it for everyone and then let's share it with everyone. 
And that has been our approach to Snapshot the whole time. A couple of questions that have come through already, I will jump into now and I'll ask um, Matt, especially if you're online, to please feel free to jump in, especially towards the end. Some of the earlier questions I think I can handle myself. Um, and some of the ones that have come through, um, a few people have asked about whether they can use their own data um, or own emissions profiles. Yes, absolutely. You work with another consultant or you've developed something internally, for example, please send it through to us. It does need to be compliant with the GPC protocol. Uh, if you're working with reputable organisations and consultants or you've been trained up yourself in that, then we're not in the business of wanting to go through um, tooth and nail, but it just does need to be compliant with the GPC. And there are many examples of councils on Snapshot where we are taking data from third parties if that's what a council wants to do, then that is no problem at all. Um, there are a few questions about, again, getting that stationary energy from Sappen. Um, as I've said, we absolutely can, theoretically, and we want to. Um, however, there still are barriers, and pretty much every time we try and get this information and we've got our team of data analysts looking into it, we find that there are large sources missing. It's interesting that it's actually the model data that we use that often tests out the veracity of the claims from distribution businesses. And we spend a lot of time going back to them saying, thanks for sending this through, but we think you're missing a big amount of, say, industrial emitters. They say, no, it's complete. We go back to them again and explain that it is not representative of what we would expect from a council of that size and makeup. This plays out over the course of a few months and then eventually the distribution business will come back and say, oh yeah, sorry, we didn't realise that actually the top 10 uh, emitters have been in, removed and we can't tell you who they are or what they are and we didn't tell you in advance. So we've been once, twice, three times bitten and a few times shy now and we want to take an approach which is more, let's go start and talk about making sure that we have a really clear understanding of what we want before getting ad hoc sporadic spreadsheets with postcodes on it from distribution businesses. Another related question that's come through around local data for waste emissions. This is a really good one. Um, can we use local data for waste? And the answer again is yes, if it is compliant. Um, many councils obviously have access to detailed local waste data sourced from collections and processing contractors. Um, you know, we've, we've seen some of this information and councils have these supplied it, supplied it to snapshot as well to say, can we use it? And while it is possible to incorporate localised data sets, the key question comes down to completeness of the data. So are you giving us a complete data set? If it can be guaranteed as a complete data set, then we can look at incorporating it. Um, note we need to just obviously undertake some analysis on waste treatment methods, etc. However, again, what commonly occurs is the data is missing segments and so we just can't consider it to be complete. For example, commercial scale waste or portions of industrial waste. So while this data might be more accurate or granular in its level or localised than state-based data, it's often not complete. So we don't know how much is missing through the missing waste sources. Is it an extra 100 tonnes, 10,000 tonnes, 100,000 tonnes? It could have a very big impact and these are the sort of things that need to be investigated. Um, and again, the, the protocol for municipal scale emissions is the, the rule book and have very clear criteria about how this, this works. And so it's one to investigate further, but the first thing is to make sure we have complete data sets. There's a question around transport data and where it comes from. So at the moment, it covers emissions from most forms of transport um, and exclusions are very consistent with what the GPC protocol says, um, such as transport within industrial facilities, for example. It's all there in the methodology, so it's all publicly available. But um, we basically use a spatial scaling factor, um, compliant with GPC, to and then use vehicle registration data by vehicle type from state to municipal level. Um, this is the starting point. We can say with this information and data that is complete, but as mentioned just before with the example from Google, the intention down the line is to make sure that we have more accurate data and then we get it and we provide it for everyone. Um, there's a question that says, why does it say our emissions have gone down? Another one 
in the text why is it that we considered a small council relative to the state average um, and Matt or Imogen I might pass over to you guys to jump in there before I do just to, to let you know that the the way that snapshot looks the way those reports look and the text that we have within those reports that give you that summary um, have been developed through a process of user groups um, and you know while there might have been disagreement around the edges around what's included and what's not we've come to that through a pretty detailed process of you know incorporating what people want to include um, Matt what happens when we've got councils and it says my emissions have gone down since 2005 where does that come from Uh, so the emissions, uh, historical emissions are based against um, uh, state level trends corrected for factors around growth for your municipality and a couple other factors. Um, so um, South Australian councils in general are seeing a reduction in emissions due to the very, very significant reduction in grid emissions intensity from grid supplied energy. So um, as to the specific circumstances of your council, you know, definitely feel free to follow up with us, with me, um, get in touch if you think there's a particular issue that you'd like to resolve. But yeah, so yeah, there's a, that's a sort of the overarching characteristics. Um, Great. In relation to the size question, um, so that uh, is something that has been raised as a couple of, um, you know, points of interest or concern uh, in other areas. So the size is just determined off the geospatial size of the municipality. Um, this is a, and that's relative to the state's average, the um, assuming that what you're, the issue you're taking is not just a straight up error, in which case please direct it to us. Um, if there's, if it, if it's just a question about how so you, you conventionally view your municipality or how you understand uh, how your municipality sort of sits in, in the state. Um, that size question is, is it more connected to how um, localities and regions and cities are talked about um, internationally. So it's um, that, that, that relative size comparison is sort of like how that's talked about internationally and it helps sort of contextualize it. But we're very interested in, um, you know, writing and communicating in ways that make sense uh, to you locally as well. So um, that sort of, you know, feedback or input, or particularly if there's genuine mistakes to be made, then then we're very interested in hearing that. Thanks, Matt. Um, another quick question about cohort reports or comparison reports. So for those um, councils that were involved in crowdfunding, the broader inclusion of South Australia. Um, I think that we'll be able to let you know something in the next few days and there shouldn't be an issue getting that out and there'll also be a workshop in August to discuss and make sure that you know we're getting exactly what we want there. So give us a few days and we'll give you an update. And just a clarifying point about waste, please don't don't feel like this is a suggestion that that information is not valuable on the, the local activity data for waste. It is incredibly valuable and it's part of the picture. It just can't be included in a snapshot or a GPC profile. Um, similarly with stationary energy data, if you have great residential stationary energy data, then that is still very valuable information when it comes to action planning. It just can't be put straight into a broader emissions um, profile because it's not compliant with GPC. Um, what have we got here? Uh, air travel is included, including domestic in GPC, but not in the tool. Matt, do you reckon you can give a 30 second response to some of those ones? There's a, there's a quick one. Uh, so we, <laughs> and if you can't, then I, uh, you can let me know. Yeah, we can so push it, push it to, out and respond later. Air, air travel is not included in GPC basic um, as a category. Um, so we have been incorporating air travel as a addition to the basic um, reporting. There are a few exceptions. So um, the air travel um, integration so far is centered around passenger travel between airports. Um, the data sets have, are um, primarily for, for um, primary, so the 20, 20 largest airports in Australia, which have a certain reporting structure um, through the federal government and through um, CASA. 
Um, and then we have a secondary regional data set that's being incorporated. There are some exceptions at the moment. Uh, some airports have incomplete data reporting, some airports are private, some have only um, local flights, so flights that take off and land at the same airport. So there are some factors uh, for how to incorporate. We're, we're sort of continuously looking for reliable data sets to expand that reporting. Awesome. Uh, Anders and uh, William and, and Ming, we might take that one offline with you guys if you like um, and look at how we can Im improve it. Um, we've got about a minute or two to go, so I might just see if there's any other. There's some questions here about um, accessing information about offsets to show neutrality or the scope of the task to get to carbon neutral. So, for example here, agriculture is a large contributor, however, Agriculture and forestry also provides the greatest offset. How is this incorporated? And I should mention, Lauren, who asked that, and to everyone, the, the detail is all available freely and publicly, transparently available in the methodology. But do you want to give us a quick response to that one, Matt? Sure. So there's um, uh, the main mechanism for uh, offsets, I guess, you know, sort of localised offsets as you're talking about them. Um, is through land use and land use change. Um, so that's essentially uh, sort of afforestation and other carbon sequestration solutions. Um, we don't typically see uh, negative carbon emissions associated with agriculture. We don't, Snapshot has no mechanism for that. There are obviously um, lower emitting agricultural practices. Um, I would be very interested in a conversation talking about meaningful tracking of carbon negative agricultural practices. Um, which I think is, you know, so regenerative agriculture is, is a really promising direction, but not currently accommodated in snapshot. Fantastic. Thank you. And we might finish up there with a quick comment that Tim has raised, which is spot on. So the reductions from, you know, generally that you'll find in emissions over the last 15 years are going to be from decarbonisation of the grid. So even more so in um, South Australia, but if you were to look at Tasmanian snapshots, for example, you will probably find a lot less electricity emissions because it's mainly from um, carbon, what are considered renewable resources. Um, the questions came have kept coming through, and as we mentioned, we will um, answer them later. Um, I hope we got to as many as possible. Um, we did put more time than usual for questions, but even then, we often don't get through them all, which I think is a good sign, um, but we will respond to them all um, afterwards. Um, I will, we'll, we'll have to wrap it up though. So thanks for attending and registering. We had 33 registrations in the end and 36 attendees. So that's a record. I don't think we've ever had more attendees than registration. So thank you everyone for coming along. Um, thank you very much to Jensen Jack, Central Coordinator of the Regional Client Partnerships, Nelly from Charles Sturt, Catherine. Dola, Crystal from Climate Ready, Imogen and Matt, who were speaking, but also behind the scenes. I know Nikki, um, Joelle and the team from BZE who have been here and involved in developing this, um, and Hannah, Rachel and the Ironbark crew. There's a hell of a lot of work that does go into this and has over a long period of time. Um, special thanks to Jen and Ellie. It's been an absolute pleasure working with you guys. Um, on this process and thanks for facilitating and managing it um, over the last couple of months. Hopefully this is just the start of that journey. We'll send information with details of the recording of the webinar in the next couple of days or week. We do want feedback as well, so please let us know afterwards. We'll send you a quick feedback form if we've missed the mark at all. But otherwise, thank you for attending. Thank you to these crowdfunding councils for getting us to where we are today. And we will catch you at the next one. Thank you.